Good afternoon. My name is uh, Matthias, and in the next 45 minutes, I'll be talking a little bit about type systems in general, in .NET, and in PowerShell. Uh, this talk is called uh, Become a Type System Ninja, or How to Become a Type System Ninja. So I'm just going to remove this, because everyone knows that ninjas wear black in order to hide themselves. This is too flashy. So, uh, I was originally slated to do this as a single presentation tomorrow morning, uh, and the idea was to dive into all the nooks and crannies that are in the type system that comes with .NET uh, CTS, uh, the extended type system in PowerShell, uh, how you might want to abuse and manipulate these type systems during runtime. Um, but it's kind of a, it would kind of be a compressed uh, presentation. So when Tobias asked if, uh, if I could fill in for uh, another presenter and do this over two slots, I thought, this is perfect. We're going to mix it up a little bit. This session today is not going to be very demo heavy. This is going to be an introduction to what I mean when I talk about type systems in the context of PowerShell and in the context of the .NET. Uh, so we're going to look a little bit about what that is and what the differences are. And then tomorrow morning, if you like what you saw here today, if you still think it's interesting, if I don't make you fall asleep in the next 45 minutes, uh, feel free to, to come back and, and we will delve in and actually write some code and, and, and try to do some cool stuff. Sounds good? All right. So uh, for now, we're going to talk a little bit about what a type system is. We're going to talk about the type system in PowerShell, the extended type system, and where that name comes from. Uh, then we're going to kind of take a step back and look at the basis for all of this, the basis for PowerShell, which is the type system that comes with the .NET framework. Uh, this is usually referred to as the common type system. This is what is called in the, um, in the open specification of, of .NET. Uh, we're going to delve in, into kind of what the building blocks in the .NET's common type system is. Um, there are a bunch of different types that come built in. Uh, what is the logical structure of the files and the code that we use to define these terms? And then we're going to look at where this name, you know, the common part of the common type system actually kind of kicks in. You know, why is this useful and why, why it's designed the way it is? And then at the end, uh, we're probably going to see a little bit of it in action. So there's going to be a few demos as well. So, uh, quick disclaimer. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I've always wanted to be a software developer, never really kind of broke ground into that industry. So I ended up being an IT ops person, sysadmin kind of gig, kind of just, you know. Then PowerShell kind of came in my way, and I was like, ooh, now I can be a software developer. And so I started writing code in PowerShell, and it's really interesting, it's really fun. And because PowerShell is built on top of .NET, I can kind of hook into all these things that I saw the cool software developers do in, in C Sharp, right? So first question, you know, what is a type system? I heard, uh, I heard a bunch of people talk about this, you know, professional software developers, C++ developers, C Sharp developers, talk about typing and type systems and how nice it was in some languages that you had inferred typing, and uh, you know, what a nightmare it was in some languages that they didn't even have a properly defined type system. And I was really curious, so I thought, I'm just gonna Google it, right? Like, what is the type system? It can't be that hard, right? So I Googled it, and um, these weird comparisons came up. Uh, people were talking about strong versus weak, weak typing. Um, I'm not that strong. Can I not play in this game? Static versus dynamic typing. What does that even mean? Explicit versus inferred typing. It was, a, it was a kind of confusing experience trying to Google my way into what type systems are and how to approach them. And the whole typing thing, like the only thing I could think of was like, why, why does it matter what I do on my keyboard? Like, I'm churning out code, right? It could be generated. What, you know, what does my, my typing speed have to do with anything? Like, do I have to be a history major and know, like, what the printing press and typesetting is all about in order to become a software developer? I don't think so. So at some point, I, I came uh, across a very helpful article uh, that explained this in a bit more simple terms. And basically what it boils down to is that a type system is the set of rules that govern data types and their behavior in a computer program, right? So we all write some code, be it PowerShell or anything else, and we're trying to make our computers execute some instructions around this data that we're defining or importing, right? So a set of rules that govern data types. 
then we kind of need to take a step back and ask, what is the type? What is the data type? A data type, in the context of programming languages and computer programs, is um, I would describe it as kind of a core property of an object, right? Where an object refers to some memory in the computer, some data that we're working on, right? We could probably define a type or a type definition as kind of a contract for the behavior of the data that we have in our computer types. You know, how does, how does an object behave when I call it a certain method on it or when I pass it as an argument to another method? What is the behavior that I could expect? This is kind of integral to what a type or a data type is, right? Uh, depending on the language, depending on the context, depending on the grammar of the language that you're using, it could also be a contract for operator behavior, right? In most languages, if I do one plus one, I mean something very differently than if I take two strings and try to plus them together, right? So the data type of the operands in any operation sometimes define what the operator is actually supposed to do, right? Plus does not necessarily mean add two, two numbers together. The concept of a data type is also not specific to object-oriented programming. It's not specific to, you know, uh, uh, small talk, C++, C sharp. Um, uh, it's kind of an integral part of, of a lot of language runtimes and, and a lot of language environments. So, back to the question, what is a type system then? Okay. It is the set of rules that govern these types, these data types that we operate on. The aim of implementing a type system in any programming environment is to reduce runtime errors, right? This may be a little foreign if, if, if PowerShell is your day-to-day uh, you -day or, or go-to programming language, but back in the day, you would sit down, you would write some code, you would run a compiler against your code, it would do a bunch of things, translating this into some machine code that the computer can, uh, can understand and, uh, and run, and then what would happen is that you would run your code uh, because you did not expect some edge case or you did not expect that the data you were operating on was malformed. Something would happen during runtime. You run your code and then the whole computer you know, catches fire. Um, that's obviously not very conducive to productivity. It's not very conducive to budgeting if your computers keep catching on fire. So the idea of introducing a type system is that we, we can have some well-defined behavior for the data that we operate on, and this then in turn reduces the errors that we encounter in runtime. We want the compiler, before we run the code, we want the compiler to tell us, your code is no good, right? You're trying to do something that you shouldn't be able to do on this data type. Uh, side effects of, of using this kind of technique to reduce runtime errors is that you can, uh, you can optimize for certain memory patterns, uh, and in some of the more like advanced high-level languages, uh, you get something called reflection, which is basically the idea that a data type or a piece of memory in your computer, right, can say something about itself, right? It can it can introspect, if you will, uh, and say something about you know I am this type kind of data type. Uh, a type system itself usually includes a core set of types that are kind of natively recognized within that programming environment. Uh, in, in PowerShell or in any .NET language, uh, you know, a string, an integer, these are, um, these are examples of, uh, of kind of the core set of types that come out of the box, right? Nobody needs to define this. Uh, and it may include extensible types, de again, depending on the, the environment of the programming language. So a couple of examples from kind of outside .NET, uh, outside PowerShell. Uh, Anyone here ever done web development or server-side development with JavaScript, Node.js, Angular, jQuery? Yeah, a couple of hands, right? So JavaScript, like, uh, like PowerShell, is very forgiving, right? You just put together a bunch of things and, you know, with the operators, JavaScript will kind of figure out what you want to do, and then sometimes you get some weirdly unexpected results, right? JavaScript actually has a type system. A bunch of people I've, I've heard complain about this, that you know, JavaScript has terrible typing support, but Java, JavaScript actually has uh, a pretty rich type, uh, type system. Uh, out of the box, you get strings, you get numbers, these can be decimal or non-decimals. Uh, you get Boolean, you know, true or false. Uh, there's a, there's a built-in array. Um, in JavaScript, a function in itself, some people talk about JavaScript as a functional language, right? A function is a first-class citizen in that language, meaning that a function is actually a type in JavaScript. Uh, and then finally, you have an object. And an object can then be extended to kind of define any, any data type. Um, 
you'll see this a lot in, in like modern JavaScript. If you start maybe reading the JavaScript I wrote as a kid when I first got into web development, you're not going to see any of this. It's just kind of hacking away, see, see whatever works. Uh, Perl is another interesting example. Uh, I work with about 900 Perl developers day to day, and the number one complaint I get from them is that Perl has a terrible typing system. Uh, basically, Perl has kind of uh, three integral types. It has something called a scalar, which is just a single thing. It could be a string, it could be a number, or it could be a reference to something. Uh, and then at runtime, Perl will try to figure out whether you want a string or you want a number. This can be a little frustrating. Um, Perl also has arrays, like most other uh, programming languages, and then Perl has something called a hash. This is a little bit like the dictionaries you find in Python, kind of a very uh, flexible, mutable kind of data type, right? Perl has a bunch of other data types that I'm not going to go into because I simply do not understand that language at all. Finally, we get these more modern kind of high-level memory-managed language where, where a bunch of things are hidden away from the user. It should be easy to use. It should be easy to you know, develop without shooting yourself in the foot, so to say. It should be easy to develop any piece of software without making too many mistakes before you actually compile your code. And what is common between uh, Java, or rather the Java VM that Java runs on, and then C Sharp and the underlying um, infrastructure there, which is .NET, is that the design philosophy between the, um, behind the uh, type system is that it's hierarchical. You have something called an object. This is kind of the, the basic thing, the basic type definition in both of those languages. And everything else extends from an object. So you take the object as a base, whatever an object can do, anything in, in these languages can do, and then you can extend that with your own functionality. Now, before we dive into uh, the .NET common type system, uh, as I said, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the extended type system, uh, which is kind of the type system we talk about when we, when we work with PowerShell. Some of you may not even have noticed that this is a thing or, or that you need to care. Maybe you don't need to care because PowerShell is very forgiven, right? You kind of just write your code and it kind of works most of the time. Um, and this makes, this makes PowerShell super easy to, to work with, right? Low barrier of entry, you don't need a big tool chain, you don't need a, a compiler, you don't need to read a big book, you just open PowerShell.exe and you start writing your code. But PowerShell has a pretty, uh, pretty impressive type system. And in order to kind of show off what, um, what, may, what may be a, a bit surprising to some, I'm going to use um, an example of this man. I don't know if you've ever met him. Uh, his name is Rob, he's on the uh, community council of this very conference. And a couple of years ago, I was, um, I was giving a presentation, the very first presentation I ever gave on the extended type system. And I was struggling to come up with an example of like, how to introduce people to this idea that there's something going on behind the scenes with these data types. And Rob was giving a presentation about the dollar profile variable. This profile, uh, is, it, is anyone familiar with the dollar profile variable? Right? It holds reference to the profile that gets loaded once you start PowerShell.exe. You can put a bunch of scripts in that file. They'll load at runtime. You get your own functions, your drives, whatever you need. Right? So the dollar profile automatic, uh, automatic uh, variable is kind of interesting uh, because it exhibits some features that is kind of uncommon for what you would expect from what looks like a string. And so let's have a look at that. I think I need to. Duplicate my screen. Can you see this in the back? Yeah? Okay. So profile, right? I kind of reference it and it just spews out a string, right? With a path to where the currently loaded profile in, in PowerShell is, right? And so if I go look at this file, it has my, it has my profile scripts, it's all fine. If I, if I look at what type the data in that variable is using the uh, get type uh, method, it'll tell me that, oh, this is a string. Okay. Um, since I know that PowerShell is built upon .NET and all the data types are basically inherited from .NET, what I might want to go, if, uh, go to if I want to figure out what a string can do or what I can do with a string is I might go to msdn or docs.microsoft.com and find the documentation for system.string. If I do this, if I go look up uh, the string and I go down here and look at what properties it has, down here, 
It tells me that a string has two properties. It has uh, length. Okay, we can kind of check that. Um, profile the length. Yeah, tells me the length of the string. That kind of makes sense. And then it has something called a, a parameterized property uh, called chars, uh, with which I can index into the individual characters in the string. Right. So the first the first um, character in the string of my profile is a uppercase C. So I can do chars zero, and I get the first character. Right. So these are the two properties that I expect this string to expose to me, right, that I can work on. But if I do profile.a and start tapping, it shows me two more properties. So, so where, where's this coming? And if I do this, right, like, these are, all, these are also strings. So where, where are they coming from? Huh. So, Back to this. It works. That did not work very well. Here we go. So, apologies for the colors if they're not maybe too readable. Uh, but this is a diagram I constructed to kind of explain what, um, what a PS object is composed of. And has anyone heard of this term before, a PS object? Right? So, it turns out that in PowerShell, when you have a string, you have the dollar profile that looks like it's a string, you don't actually have a string. Every single object in the partial runtime, you know, in the command line, is wrapped in something called a PS object. A PS object is a little bit to PowerShell what the system.object is to .NET. This idea that you kind of have a base class that you can extend with any functionality that you need. You can add data to it, you can add properties to it, you can add uh, methods to it. And so when you use a command line like add member, for example, you take a string, right, and you pipe it to add member, and then you add some properties to it. Nothing actually gets added to the string, because the string only has two properties, right? But it gets added to this PS object layer that kind of wraps everything in PowerShell. And so, why have I written this, right? Dollar underscore dot PS base, PS extended, PS object, PS adapted. What is, what is this about? It turns out that if, if you use um, get member, um, if we go back here, If I take the profile variable and I pipe that to get member, this is kind of a partial reflection 101. Get member is going to show me every single method and every single property that, um, that the object I just piped in has. We can see down here it has the length, it has the charge parameterized property, but it also has these all users, all host, all users, current host, note properties. And so these are not part of the actual string. These are part of this PS object layer. And we can access this PS object layer directly by referencing something called a member set PS object. And now we get a whole bunch of information here. If we go back and we say pipe profile to get member, and we want member type member set. These are hidden by default, so we need to use the dash force parameter. It is going to show me that this object has four member sets. These are in the name, names I mentioned on this slide before, right? PS adapted, PS base, PS extended, and PS object. The idea is that PS base holds a reference to the actual .NET object, the actual string that we saw when we just do dollar profile. PS adapted uh, holds all the properties that are adapted from kind of the native type system that we've imported this in. And this idea of adapting different types from not necessarily .NET is what allows us to do uh, rich interaction with WMI, rich interaction with kind of native syntax for XML, um, COM objects, that sort of thing, right? 
Then finally down here, we have a member set called PS Extended, and this is basically what we can attach anything to, right? Uh, we have an object, it's been adapted from either .NET or XML or something else, and now we can kind of enrich this object with, um, uh, with further properties of further members like we just saw with uh, Dash Profile. So if we look at Profile again, and then we can kind of access all of this through PS Object. Um, it's probably just gonna dial it down a little bit here. We can see here that it exposes the base object. This is the same as the reference to PS base. So again, you can see the value of it this is just this string to my profile. It has something called members, which contains both properties, methods, and anything else. Uh, it has a reference to type names, uh, which we'll get in a little, into a little bit tomorrow. But basically, if I look at the properties here, it's going to list all of these properties that it has from the fact that it's a, it's a string itself, Length, these are denoted as just properties. And then all of this extended data that's added. Um, these usually come up as no properties, but the extended partial, uh, the extended type system in partial has a bunch of other interesting things like script methods. Uh, you can basically do properties with getters and setters and that, that sort of thing. All right. Okay. Now to the real core of what I really want to talk about. The, the kind of strength and interoperability of .NET comes from com something called the common type system. You may know this, that you can write any piece of code in C Sharp, and you can import it into a Visual Basic .NET project or into PowerShell, and it'll interoperate as if you had you know, written it in the same language. And again, apologize for the colors here. Um, this diagram kind of shows conceptually what the idea Behind, uh, behind .NET or the common language uh, infrastructure, as it's called in, in the standard specification, is. The idea is, again, C Sharp, VB.NET is obviously a bit dated because it says J Sharp. I don't think anyone actually uses that. But the idea is that you, you write a compiler that compiles whatever code we have up here down to, to kind of a, a common set of criteria that we call the common language infrastructure. Um, Everything basically gets compiled into an intermediate language called the common intermediate language. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, you know, uh, reversing tools or, um, or debuggers refer to something called MSIL, MSIL, this is like the Microsoft implementation of the, the common intermediate language. And then the idea is that since everything is now compiled to like the same common language, they can all run side by side in the same runtime, right? So we, we don't really need to discriminate against what kind of programming language uh, a developer or a contributor or a user wants to use. And so, again, kind of code in any language that, that compiles against the net, and then you can reuse any code from any language that compiles against the net. And so I'm gonna try to show what this actually means in practice. Um, Can you zoom in a bit? Yeah. Does anyone know what the keyboard shortcut for zooming in in Visual Studio is? Yeah, that doesn't seem to work. Yeah, that doesn't work. Um, oh, there, perfect, thank you. A little bigger, maybe. How about this? Yeah. All right, <laughs> just gonna close this Solution Explorer over here. So, basically what I have here, um, what I have here is a, is, a, um, is a script or a file that is written in F sharp. So F sharp is a, is a language that compiles against um, the .NET runtime. It looks a bit like uh, the, uh, the ML or CAMEL family of languages. It's a, basically a functional programming language. And if you're used to seeing either PowerShell, C++, or you know, C++ deri derivatives like C Sharp, this may look a little weird, but uh, it's pretty cool. And it's, um, uh, you, you can get some, uh, some pretty nice performance characteristics for certain, uh, um, um, for certain programming or, or workloads using a, a functional programming like, languages like this. F Sharp also has a way of defining types, or classes as we might call them in other languages. And basically you just supply the type keyword, we define a name for the type that we want to define. Uh, 
here we have uh, a bunch of parameters for a default constructor. You can see here I can, I can mock that the name parameter should be a string, but I don't really care about H. I'll let the f -sharp compiler figure out what that needs to be. And then basically what I want to do is I want to assign the, assign the name parameter to, um, to a, a member of this type called name, H to H, and then I have like a, a, a static member down here, um, which is just a comment partial rule super hard. So what I can do here is I'm going to build this. Um, so I get Visual Studio to compile this code. And what I get down here is uh, a DLL, an assembly file. And then over here, I have another project. And I'm going to zoom in again. And we maybe do 300. Perfect. Over here, I have another project that's written in C Sharp, so a totally different programming language, but it also compiles against the uh, .NET um, and, and runs on .NET. And so the idea here is that I'm going to, in the references over here, I'm just going to delete this and re-edit. I'm going to add a reference to my to the F Sharp code that we that we just uh, compiled a second ago. And then I'm going to say, I want to, I want to import this, my F-sharp F class that I just compiled. And then I'm going to define another type, uh, in this case a class, in C-sharp. So I have a public class uh, role mapping. This could be for like a, you know, a role-based access control system or something like that. And in the constructor for the role mapping object, I want to be able to pass in a role name and then some person who gets that role, right? Defined using the class that we just wrote in another language. And so, if I build this, the C Sharp compiler is totally happy with this. It doesn't care that what I just wrote was in another language. It just takes it in and says, yeah, this is all .NET. This is fine. I can reuse this. So what I'm going to do in my shell here is I'm going to use the uh, at type commandlet. I'm going to give the path to the F Sharp class that I just uh, compiled. And what you can see here is after using at type, um, I can now access uh, the code that I just wrote in another language. And I can say I want a new F sharp person. Uh, and you remember I had to pass in my in a name and age, and then we have our person, right? And it retains the comment that I defined for this. So I wrote this in F Sharp five minutes ago, and now I'm using it in PowerShell. It's totally fine. You don't need to know C Sharp now. You can go learn another language if you want to get something into PowerShell. But here's where the real magic comes in. The C Sharp class that holds a reference to that F Sharp class that I also just compiled, if I add that into PowerShell, type. No worries, it's not complaining about anything. And now, the role mapping. See that the constructor here <coughs> takes a role name and then it takes an object of this type, the F sharp person. So I'm going to create a new role mapping. Let's say that um, I'm a PowerShelly. And as you can see, I could easily just pass in the object that, again, was defined in another language into the constructor of this thing that was then defined in the third language, right? And I have my role mapping object here. I can reference the person, and it still has um, all of these nice things. So, this was basically this introduction to what the .NET common type system is, what the PowerShell extended type system is, and what it kind of covers. Um, as, as I hope to have shown you, PowerShell is kind of .NET++ in that it adds a bunch of functionality on top of the existing type system in .NET. 
which is already pretty powerful, but then most of this magic is kind of transparent to you, right? Most of you might not have noticed that the whole dollar profile thing was going on in the background. Um, if this was interesting, tomorrow I'll have a hopefully longer and richer session with a bunch more demos. Um, we're going to look at emitting new types at runtime, so not actually having to pre-compile code, but doing that at runtime. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at uh, how ECS employs conversion logic, so converting from one type to another without you even noticing it. Um, we're going to look a little bit at what kind of static typing looks like in PowerShell, and how we can abuse this reflection thing I introduced earlier. Uh, if you're really geeking out on type systems, um, uh, Jared Atkinson is sitting right over here, and he has uh, another talk tomorrow about uh, reflection in PowerShell, uh, looking again at more reflection magic, uh, type marshalling, and native APIs. So if you need to call into something, you know, a Windows API that you cannot call directly from .NET, you know, how do you do that? Any questions? Right, so a class, uh, again, this is, this is depending on like the language, the, the kind of programming domain we're in, right? But a class is a kind of type. So in, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that um, .NET has a bunch of built-in types, right? Uh, you have something like uh, an integer, uh, or you have a string, uh, and these are kind of fairly simple types. They're not, a string is, but an, an integer is not, a, is not a class. You can create an integer, and integer is a type, but an integer is not a class. So a class is a subset of what we would define as a type. Uh, the big difference between, um, the big difference between uh, a class and a more simple data type is that you can usually predict the size and memory of an instance of a non-class object, so a simple object, right? A 32-bit integer is always going to fit into 32 bits of memory. Whereas if I have a class with a, you know, a bunch of different strings attached, a bunch of uh, integers attached, it has a, uh, a bunch of code attached, right? There's no way for me to look at, at the type and say, oh, this is a class, I know it must be you know, this, many, this many megabytes uh, big uh, in memory, right? So this is kind of the defining factor. Does that make sense? Huh? Not exactly. Okay. Well, it does make sense, but it doesn't get me that much further getting why I would use one or the other. Or if that is even a Right. So, like, the, the, right, okay. So, the reason for, like, using, like, non-complex types or, like, non-class data types is, again, the fact that you can predict how much memory is needed to fit to fit that into your program, into the runtime, right, means that uh, .NET does not have to keep, uh, keep track of a bunch of references to these objects all over the place. It can just say, okay, I, need, I have an array of you know, 10 integers. I know that that's going to be exactly, um, what is that, 40 bytes, right? Uh, and so from, from a performance and memory optimization point of view, uh, you might say, if I can do something with a simpler data type, I might want to go for that rather than uh, implement a class. <laughs> Sure. Right. Okay. Right. 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 Yeah. I, th I think one way of, and feel free to correct me, but I think one way of summarizing this is that uh, a class is a, is a blueprint for an object that represents some business logic, right? Um, where the class itself is the blueprint, right? And as soon as you then create an instance using this blueprint, right, then you have an object, right? And you know, you can create, you know, many of these, you can create many objects with just a single definition, with just your class serving as, as a single blueprint, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much, then.